thank you all for um, coming to the Danube Institute on this uh, miserable evening, which has got um, geopolitically more miserable by the minute. Um, and in this context, we have the pleasure of hosting uh, Stephen Kimchok Massion, um, who is a strategic analysis, uh, corporate strategic analysis, um, who comes from Vancouver, but from Polish exile parents, uh, and has worked across, for, for, uh, looking at strategic scenarios generally, but also from a corporate and business perspective. Stephen is the joint author of a book he's just published uh, with a foreword by the excellent British historian Andrew Roberts on the enduring crown commonwealth, the past, present, and future of the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand relationship and why it matters. So this has just come out. Um, the importance of the work is to uh, attest the continuing relevance of that um, Kanzuk relationship, Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand, as what was originally termed the Anglosphere. It's also sometimes used to include the US as well. And this is one of the themes of what um, uh, Stephen's talk is going to be about tonight, the enduring relevance of the um, Anglosphere. And it's, uh, at the moment, it's very clear importance to this part of the world in terms of not only the Ukraine war, but other aspects of supporting Central Europe against those who um, uh, you know, detract from its uh, independence and its sovereign status post um, the communist era. And Stephen, having come from or hailed from this part of the world, also wants to draw attention to the enduring nature of this Anglospheric relationship with um, Central Europe. So with this background in mind, with his um, geostrategic uh, uh, understanding and his particular work in the private sector with leading management consultancies and including advising Sir John Templeton's private portfolio, which must be an interesting job to do, I hand over to Stephen to enlighten us more about the, um, the character of the Five Eyes relationship and its relationship to Central Europe. David, thank you very much for that generous introduction. I also want to thank the Danube Institute for finding somewhere on, on the internet a rather old photo of me, uh, which, uh, which shows me in a little bit of a younger time. Um, and thank you very much for coming. So I think I'm ready to begin with my uh, presentation here. So I call my presentation Five Eyes, Four Realms, and Central Europe. But there's an alternative title which I call the Anglosphere in Central Europe, a very a personal view, or I might say a very personal view, or perhaps even a very, very, very personal view. My presentation today is about the relationship between Central Europe and the English-speaking world, past, present, and future. I speak as both a North American and as a Polish citizen. You might say I'm a Polish-Canadian Californian who used to live in Switzerland. I'm also the son of anti-communist po Polish political exiles. If the 20th century was a time of catastrophe of Europe, well, then I'm a child of catastrophe. My late parents were effectively stateless from 1945 to 1957, and you can only imagine how inconvenient it is to be stateless. These images show the refugee travel document my father used in the early 1950s. Again, he didn't have a national passport. He wouldn't have carried a, a communist Polish passport. 
But the page in this travel document that always fascinated me was this one at the very back of the travel document. So as you may know, the uh, financial circumstances of the UK in the post-war era uh, were not good. Uh, Britain uh, was uh, in financial difficulty and therefore imposed exchange controls, which meant that there were limits on how much money you could take out of Britain. Actually, the exchange controls lasted as late as 1979 when Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher abolished them finally. So when my father was getting ready to emigrate from England to Canada in 1951, he was permitted under the exchange controls regime to take out of Britain on, on leaving and starting a new life in, in North America a full 20 pound sterling that you can see there. Um, in today's money, that's just under 800 pounds. So um, not a lot to start your life with, but uh, my parents made the best of it. In September 1938, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain famously, or rather infamously, said that Nazi Germany's designs on Czechoslovakia were, quote, a quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing, end quote. This statement would seem to suggest that the Anglosphere's connection to Central Europe has only ever been minimal at best. In this presentation, I will hope to persuade you that, in fact, the connection has been long and substantial, in some respects going back literally centuries. Certainly today, the connection between the English-speaking countries and Central Europe is very strong, if at times and in certain areas tense and even controversial. I will come back to that. This is probably a good point for me to tell you how I define both areas of the world. There are many definitions of Central Europe, and in this talk I should state up front that I'm speaking primarily about East Central Europe a region which has quite a lot of shared history and culture. I mean the Visegrad four countries plus some other neighboring areas of Europe. Would I include, for example, the Baltic states in this definition? Yes, partly. My definition includes the area of the Old Kingdom of Hungary, the lands of the Holy Crown of St. Stephen, as well as much of the territory of the old Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which at one time included most of the present-day Baltic countries. You see here a map of Poland between the two world wars, which of course looks quite different from the map of the Poland of today, as a result of the territorial, territorial changes forcibly imposed on the country by Stalin. My late mother was born in the very northeasternmost part of central Poland, that's in the uh, top right quadrant near the Latvian border, an area now situated in present day Belarus. This very spot is arguably the northern border of Central Europe. On the same latitude as Denmark, however, where pastel-colored Baroque churches were as common as they are a thousand kilometers to the south. This particular photo shows just such a pastel-colored Baroque church, which in this particular case, uh, my mother attended as a child in that northeastern tip of Poland near the border with Latvia in the 1930s. Today, this place is located in Belarus, and the church appears, I must say, pretty dilapidated and in serious need of renovation, uh, pretty much like all of Belarus. But one might say Central Europe definitely ends when the alphabet switches from the Roman to the Cyrillic. Other culture observers might say you know you are in Central Europe when you see houses and buildings chalked with the letters C plus M plus B for the Feast of the Epiphany on January 6th each year. Now for the Anglosphere. Here I mean primarily the countries of the Five Eyes Intelligence Sharing Alliance, which arguably is at the heart and center of the West security architecture. In 1946, America and Britain signed a highly secret instrument called the UK-USA Agreement. And although things about it had leaked out over the years, it was not officially made public until 2010. The faint image you see here is the declassified cover sheet of the original agreement marked top secret. 
By 2021, however, Five Eyes was sufficiently out of the shadows to be able to celebrate publicly the 75th anniversary of the original agreement. Early on, as I think most of you know, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand joined the alliance as well. Together today, the five countries constitute what is undoubtedly the world's dominant economic, technological, military, and cultural zone. One can argue about university rankings and brain power hubs, but a case could be made that all of the world's top 10 universities today are based in the Five Eyes countries, and that the vast majority of the world's top 50 universities are also based there too. I probably don't need to tell you that this is the geographic area that gave birth to Silicon Valley and the city of London, McKinsey and Goldman Sachs, Harvard, MIT, and Oxbridge, BlackRock and Blackstone, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and Google, to name just a few. I'm not suggesting that all of the things and trends the English-speaking world exports to Europe and the rest of the world are good ones. And if the USA is the senior partner in this Anglosphere alliance, the other four, increasingly referred to as the Kansas realms, as David mentioned, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK, form a distinct community of nations with myriad links past and still very much present, the subject of my new book. Newly printed Canadian passports ask that the bearer be allowed to pass freely in the name of His Majesty King Charles III. And my own Canadian passport says I can seek out a British or Australian government office in case of need. In the military sphere, the Anglosphere continues to break new ground. As with the AUKUS Trilateral Security Pact established in 2021 between Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States, focusing not only on nuclear submarine development, but on cyber, AI, quantum, and hypersonic technologies. There is talk that the other two Five Eyes countries, Canada and New Zealand, may also in due course join AUKUS in some capacity. With these regional definitions out of the way, when can we say that substantial links between the Anglosphere and Central Europe first developed? I think the right answer is the Middle Ages, and the reason was trade. The Polish-Lithuanian dual monarchy, which then included most of the territory of present-day Ukraine and its famous Black Earth, was Europe's largest producer and exporter of grain. This grain made its way to Poland's Baltic ports for export to feed Western Europe, including England, and English and Scots traders and merchants started to come in substantial numbers to Central Europe. The Polish realm was also a major exporter of timber and flax, which became increasingly relevant to England when that country became a global maritime power. Britannia's aspiration to rule the waves required Central European timber to build its ships and Central European flax to make its rigging, not to mention hemp, tar, and pitch. The image you see here is, of course, Admiral Nelson's storied flagship at Trafalgar, HMS Victory, from the age of sail and of wooden ships and iron men. This large-scale Baltic trade between Central Europe and England continued for centuries, typically with Dutch middlemen. Notice the Dutch-style architecture in Gdansk, or Danzig as it used to be known, centered on grain and forest products, and Central Europe in turn received such import commodities as cloth, sugar, tobacco, and coffee. You might say, this is all very well and good, but what about Hungary? We're in, we're in Budapest tonight. Well, a momentous 18th century conflict in the British Isles would bring a large wave of gentlemanly emigres to this part of Central, Europe's, Central Europe. Britain's last Catholic king, James II, was driven into exile as the Jacobite Stuart cause was lost. Large numbers of Irish gentlemen and army officers also went into exile. An episode generally known as the Flight of the Wild Geese, finding new careers in the armies of France, Spain, and other continental countries. Many, unsurprisingly, entered the service of the Habsburgs after 1691, and over 100 Irishmen attained the rank of general or field marshal in Habsburg service, including this one, Field Marshal Count de Lacy. Last year, when I was in, uh, browsing one of my favorite bookshops in London, Hatchards, which now has not only new books but used books, I spotted this one uh, right up my street, 
The Wild Goose and the Eagle, A Life of Marshall von Braun, a very German-Hungarian sounding name, I'm sure you'll agree, uh, about just such an Irishman uh, made good in this part of the world. Less than a century later, the Anglosphere had expanded well beyond Britain, and another momentous historical event took place, the American War of Independence, which attracted various aristocratic European, including Central European, officers to fight for the American cause, romantically inspired by the cause of freedom rather than democracy, I might add. The Polish-Lithuanian Constitution, or, uh, excuse me, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth actually based its new constitution of May 3rd, 1791, largely on the new United States Constitution that had come into force some two years earlier, adapting American ideas to reforming Central European constitutional monarchy. May 3rd is today a very important national holiday in Poland, commemorating the adoption of the world's second oldest modern written constitution and Europe's first. Edmund Burke was one of many prominent admirers of the new co Polish constitution. Unfortunately, this far-sighted document, intelligently designed to remedy Poland's weaknesses and structural problems, came too late. As you know, the country was gobbled up by its neighbors and entirely wiped off the map of Europe in 1795. A half century later, the failed revolutionary upheavals in 1848 would see thousands of Central Europeans go into exile in Britain. One of the most famous of these was Hungarian national hero Lajos Kossuth, who traveled extensively in the United States before moving to London to live there for most of the 1850s. In America, Kossuth was received at the White House twice by President Millard Fillmore and was generally feted and celebrated everywhere he went. So great was American enthusiasm for him that he was hailed as the George Washington of Hungary, and many American parents of the time actually named their babies after him. However, by the late 19th century, Central Europeans in America were more likely to be relatively poor immigrants seeking a better life in the New World. More than 10 million Central Europeans emigrated to North America during the several decade period of mass immigration. Canadian government policy sought to attract large numbers of Ukrainians to settle and farm the Canadian prairie and make it a big success, which they have very much done. This Im image may appear to be a photo taken in Ukraine, but in fact this is very much a Canadian scene as Canadian churches and communities are common and visible across the whole of Western Canada, making the region a kind of second Ukraine in the New World. And, it, and industrializing Central Europe would find itself linked during this period to America's King Cotton. Central Europe's most notable industrial boomtown was the city of Łódź in the Russian partition of Poland, which was barely a village of 200 souls essentially earlier. Uh, this is the one slide where I do have a word on the slide, uh, just so you know how um, that city is spelled and pronounced in Polish. Dubbed the Polish Manchester, Łódź boomed thanks to a combination of American cotton, German capital, and unfettered access to the entire consumer market of the Russian Empire, which readily bought all of its textile products. Stupendous fortunes were made overnight, and the city's leading industrialists built palatial residences for themselves equal to, if not more extravagant than, those built by rich entrepreneurs anywhere else in the world during that period. This was the private residence built for Polish Jewish entrepreneur Israel Poznanski, which is today a museum. And here is the Poznanski family mausoleum in the city's Jewish cemetery. You will see today similarly impressive tombs in the Protestant and Catholic cemeteries of Łódź. And frankly, the only place I've ever visited modern tombs of similar magnificence is the Recoleta Cemetery in Buenos Aires, built during Argentina's own um, booming age of rapid wealth creation, very much in the past, I might say, for Argentina. 
Despite these growing links between America and Central Europe, the United States remained officially aloof from the affairs of Europe until the coming of the First World War. In George Washington's famous farewell address of 1796, he said, quote, the great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is, in extending our commercial relations, to have with them as little political connection as possible, end quote. One can understand the sentiment. The new country had disentangled itself from Britain. The old world was an ocean away, and so America could concentrate on its own internal development. If some would call this posture isolationism, by the early 20th century, the United States would also embrace interventionism in international affairs, or rather bounce back and forth between isolation and intervention. Although the United States was a latecomer to the First World War, as would later be the case in the Second World War, America's entry into the conflict in 1917 was a turning point and would shape the future of Central Europe to a degree few could have thought possible or predicted. President Woodrow Wilson had not previously shown any in great interest in foreign affairs, and his instinctive anti-Catholic and anti-Habsburg sentiments were no great secret. His controversial 14 points, and of course this is a, a, a famous painting of Woodrow Wilson and Clemenceau and others at the, uh, in, the, in the Great Hall of Mirrors at, at the Palace of Versailles. Um, so his controversial 14 points combined, in my view, the good, the bad, and the ambiguous. Point 13 seems to me entirely correct and just. There'd be a restoration of an independent Polish state with free and secure access to the sea. Since 1914, even the Central Powers and the Russian Empire had already made their own promises to restore Poland to the map of Europe as an autonomous, if not fully independent, state. Then there was point 10, and here I quote, the people of Austria-Hungary, whose place among the nations we wish to see safeguarded and assured, should be accorded the freest opportunity to autonomous development, end quote. Of course, what this came to mean in practice was the dissolution of the dual monarchy and the painful breakup of Hungary that culminated at Trianon in 1920. Unfortunately, well, actually, even before I get to that, I will show you a picture that I took in Warsaw earlier this year. So America was involved in other ways uh, in the immediate post-war period uh, after 1918. So this is a picture I took of the, and here you can see a little Polish grammar at work, Skwer Herberta Klarka Huvera. So before he became president, Herbert, Herbert Hoover was very much involved in organizing on a mass scale relief efforts to feed um, the starving in, in Central Europe and his, uh, in, the, in the aftermath of the First World War and his memory is particularly revered, not just at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, but uh, in Poland. Unfortunately, two decades later, an even more terrible war would come to Europe and all the Anglosphere countries would come to participate in it. As in the Great War, British, Canadian, Australian, and New Zealand soldiers would fight with bravery, skill, and distinction. And so did the Americans after December 7th, 1941, and indeed the industrial might of the United States would prove to be decisive. The Polish and Czechoslovak governments in exile were very active and were based in London after the fall of France, though of course they had much concern about what the ultimate fate of Central Europe would be after the war. The Polish government in exile, which by the way continued to exist in London until 1990, was then giving thought to cementing the Anglo-Polish alliance by restoring the constitutional monarchy after the war's end and making His Royal Highness Prince George the Duke of Kent the new King of Poland. However, it was not to be. Poland did not regain her freedom and this member of the British royal family was killed on active service in an air crash. Uh, this is a picture I took again in London uh, at Westminster Cathedral commemorating all ranks of the Polish forces who gave their lives for Poland and for Britain. Again, uh, 
Central Europe and the Anglosphere connected in tragedy. Most galling to Central Europeans was the so-called betrayal at Yalta in February 1945, when the United States and Britain tacitly agreed to give the Soviet Union a free hand and dominant role in the region. Among the big three, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin, Churchill made some attempt to stick up for Polish interests, but by the end of the war, a bombed out and financially bankrupt UK had very limited clout. Some may remember that the U chief US negotiator at Yalta was Alger Hiss, who was almost certainly a Soviet asset and sympathizer. This tragic reorganization of Central Europe after so under Soviet control would in turn bring a large new wave of Central European displaced persons to the English-speaking countries, especially to Canada, Australia, the UK, and the United States. If my parents had made a slightly different decision, we would have ended up down, down under and I would be speaking to you with a broad Australian accent. During the Cold War itself, everyone here will know that the great Cardinal Mincenti, Prince Primate of Hungary, would have to take refuge on a small bit of American territory here in Budapest when in 1956 he took political asylum in the U.S. legation, which would become his home for 15 years. Uh, I think everyone here will recognize this precious object, the Holy Crown of Hungary, which would also take exile in the United States, taken by U.S. troops to the United States and safeguarded until 1978 at Fort Knox in Kentucky, the impregnable U.S. Uh, gold depository. Uh, as I think most of you will know here, President uh, Jimmy Carter controversially gave it back to Hungary in, in 1978 uh, before, um, before Hungary was uh, truly a free country. Um, Speaking of other exiled objects, some of you may know that Britain took the risk of sending most of its gold reserves to Canada during the Second World War by ship, which I think was, um, was a quite risky uh, maneuver. Uh, but this book in my library is, is uh, one I'm especially fond of, The Strange Odyssey of Poland's National Treasures, 1939 to 1961, a Polish-Canadian story. And on the cover of it is not only the maple leaf, but Poland's most precious uh, surviving element from its crown jewels, the uh, coronation sword from the 13th century. So uh, a lot of Poland's national treasures ended up in Canada, and uh, after the war, the uh, new communist Polish government was very eager to get them back and was constantly making efforts with the Canadians who were reluctant to return these objects to communist Poland. But after the death of Stalin, and uh, a, a lot of uh, efforts to uh, uh, avoid um, uh, going along with this request. Uh, Canada, since like other countries of the West had recognized the People's Republic of Poland, uh, did finally give back um, these national treasures. However, the Cold War status quo would not last, I'm happy to remind us all, as the Danube Institute's president, John O'Sullivan, whom I'm, who I'm sorry is not here with us tonight, has written in his wonderful book, The President, the Pope, and the Prime Minister, two Anglosphere leaders, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, together with a Polish Pope, John Paul II, would together change the course of history. The late Soviet system would, could not withstand the combined economic, military, and moral force of the West and collapsed with a swiftness few could have predicted. The captive nations of Central Europe became free countries and free peoples again, in this case with the help and support of the English-speaking world. Today, the Anglosphere is, of course, more engaged with Central Europe than ever before with deep commercial and military ties. Obviously, the NATO presence has substantially increased since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, as indeed it needed to. In Poland and the Baltic area, large contingents of American, British, and Canadian troops are now present to create a credible deterrent, and this military assistance has very high levels of public support in Poland and the Baltic countries. 
More controversial are the frictions between the Anglosphere's left of center governments and the conservative Polish and Hungarian governments. I live in Canada, and the highly progressive Trudeau government has seen its popularity plummet recently. And if current trends hold, the next generation will, uh, next general election will see the conservatives back in power in Ottawa. Some of you may know the old saying that Canada was supposed to get British government, French culture, and American know-how, but in fact got French government, American culture, and British know-how. <laughs> Maybe there's a little truth to that. More controversial is the Biden administration's apparent hostility to the Hungarian government based on current administration policies that wish to promote and export its left-leaning vision of social progress around the world. Many wonder if America's withdrawal of Hungarian citizens from the US visa waiver program is a kind of punishment for Hungary's domestic policies. I'm sure many in this room have opinions on that. Well, I hope I've persuaded you that the relationship between the English-speaking world and Central Europe is not only substantial, but goes back much, much further than the 20th century. And I will be happy to take your questions and comments and for us all to have a very vigorous discussion. But before I sit down and, we, and have us get started in that, I have to acknowledge the fact that many of us have the Middle East on our minds tonight, that the uh, shocking attack that Hamas has uh, done on Israel uh, has put us in uncharted waters. I, I think many of us feel that we were already living in Cold War II with one hot war already uh, in Europe, and now it seems we have a, a second hot war brewing in the Middle East, and, and God help us if something starts in Asia or elsewhere. So thank you very much, and um, let's have a chat. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. I think, you know, in terms of, as you just ended that, before going on with the discussion, uh, someone has something to say from the audience about the current situation. Uh, Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Theo Bash. Uh, some of you know me. I'll take two, three minutes and try to maybe bring you guys up to speed to what's happening in the Middle East and Israel in particular. I'm a Romanian, Hungarian, Israeli, Canadian, American. I think that qualifies me for this. About uh, one to two weeks ago, there was a meeting in Beirut where the uh, Iranians basically agreed to the plan of the Hamas to basically attack uh, Israel on Saturday morning. Uh, the training of the Hamas troops, a lot of it took place actually in uh, Lebanon, where we've been watching for weeks the Hezbollah training with motorcycles, and if you have seen that maybe. Um, the present situation is this. There is over 800 um, Israelis killed, including the military. There are 2,400 uh, 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 um, wounded people, and we estimate about 150 uh, hostages, women, children, civilians, etc. I have no figures on the uh, uh, Gaza situation because the bombing is continuous, so uh, I'm sure it's going to reach in several thousands in the end when this is over. As of now, Israel has uh, mobilized at least 70%. There is 300,000 troops mobilized, 80% in the south of Israel, 20% in the north of Israel, because of the danger of a possible war with the, uh, the Hezbollah and the Lebanese. There are various theories of what happened and how this was uh, reached, how come that Hamas was able to break in 80 places a border, 80, 80, in a matter of minutes, but if anybody has seen the demonstrations from the Gaza side with the burning tires, they basically hit explosive and uh, uh, weapons by the border, so they started and did that. I'm not gonna go over exactly what happened in the Kibbutzim and Moshavim. You can see this in the news. Um, there is no way to qualify that. I uh, compared this present situation, I mean to, uh, I study politics, uh, one of my professions is I work in anti-terror. I'm a specialist in biological warfare. I build uh, laboratories for testing, for explosives, for uh, biological weapons, and so on. Um, I believe that we're looking at situations similar to Trump in uh, the 2020s, when um, he was basically, uh, 
actually undermined by the information services, CIA, FBI, DOJ, whatever you want, CDC, Fauci, and all that, in order to be brought down. Uh, at this time, one of the information that I have is that this all happened so that the uh, BB government can be brought down, and there was a basic miscalculation that things went far further than the information services believed. Another theory is that Russia has a major interest in this because they're trying to block an Indian, Indian, Iranian, uh, Turkish, uh, Russian uh, uh, line that will basically be parallel to the famous Chinese uh, Silk Road. And the um, situation will get worse. As of now, Gaza is under total blockade, including water, which I think it's a mistake, but doesn't matter. There's over two million people over there. You know, hoping that uh, the population will bring down Hamas is basically naive, in my opinion. I don't think the population can bring down Hamas. But this is the strategy they're using today. I'm not here to judge in any way. Obviously, I have a side because I have family and friends and so on. But I don't agree with people getting uh, killed, as I don't agree what's happening with the war between Ukraine and Russia where people are getting killed. Uh, everybody has noticed the large number of rockets that have gotten through the Iron Dome. And one of the reasons is the uh, oversaturation, which we knew this would happen. And the other one is estimated that technologies that reached Ukraine from the United States that basically fooled the anti-rockets has been transferred to Hamas. We can see on Hamas weapons that were left by Americans in Afghanistan. And they have identified weapons that were shipped to Ukraine and the reach to Hamas. And uh, I hope for peace. Thank you very much. Well, that was uh, very enlightening, Theo. We can return to that maybe later. But to continue back to um, Stephen's uh, excellent talk, I thought the way you um, uh, integrated your own personal history with a history of the um, Anglosphere and Central Europe was um, very nicely done. Um, and it provoked a number of obvious, well, it provoked in me a number of questions. Uh, the first one is, um, to be a bit provocative, I suppose, is that um, we've got the Kanzuk relationship, which is um, the uh, which following the title of your your book, An Enduring Crown Commonwealth, which um, both uh, conservatives in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and Aust uh, Canada would all subscribe to. Um, but, you know, one of the moments that you, you dwelt on was uh, the American Revolution, um, 1776, and how Poland, you know, drew on that constitution. But 1776 was, if you like, uh, uh, where America breaks the enduring Crown Commonwealth. In fact, it saw George III as um, a despotic tyrant and um, everything to do with um, monarchy and that kind of conservative constitutionalism was something that America was trying to break away from. And in a sense, you know, when we use the term the Anglosphere, we tend to th throw in the US as well and see, and of course it's an important ingredient there, but the, um, the real heart of an Anglosphere would be the Commonwealth countries. And there seems to be a, a, a slippage, if you like, or a, uh, a tendency to elide America into the Anglosphere when it sort of suits conservative opinion, and, and then to um, say, well, it's not really um, on the same uh, wavelength when it comes to other issues to do with, well, for instance, if you're in the UK, the way it treats Northern, well, Northern Ireland sometimes. So I wondered whether you could elaborate a bit more about whether there is a coherence to the Anglosphere, given that there is a mighty United States, which doesn't really need it, and the Commonwealth countries, which have had a very different you know, historical evolution and constitutional evolution. Uh, thank you, David. Can you hear me? So, um, you know, uh, 
What's interesting to me is that uh, the, uh, the American War of Independence, or if you prefer to call it American Revolution, which I don't, um, was perhaps a break that didn't need to happen, uh, but communications were bad in those days, and I think London and the American colonies had difficulty communicating what their uh, various concerns were. Uh, the British learned a lot from this experience, and that's why um, uh, the Crown lives on in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and a number of other countries, because uh, Britain did learn how to, in a sense, create new British countries, if you will that remain tied to it uh, uh, up, in, up to the present day. But, um, you know, uh, what's always fascinated me is that a number of the American, great American historical figures and founding fathers, some of them were actually great uh, British loyalists, crown loyalists, uh, until they felt that a break was inevitable. So, um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but George Washington, so enjoyed being a colonel in the Virginia militia and wearing a British militia uniform that he actually applied to become an officer in the, uh, in the regular British army, and that was turned down. It's probably the worst mistake the British ever made. Imagine George Washington was a British general um, rather than an American one. Likewise, Ben Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, was, uh, was a very keen supporter of the Unity Empire until he thought um, it was no longer possible to keep it together. So he had to, he had, had to make a decision. But I, again, I think, it, it, I think there is a unity of culture amongst the English-speaking countries today, uh, despite the fact that the United States and, and the other members of the Five Eyes uh, are a bit culturally different. Um, and Canada is an interesting case because it blends a bit the British and the American in its own distinctive North American way. But uh, in this relationship, uh, there's no question who the senior partner is. It is the United States, and I think uh, the, other, the other four countries know that, um, and they each have their own very important relationships with the United States, in addition to having their own important relationships uh, with one another. Oh, thank you. Um, before I had a Oh, by the way, I should mention I'm I'm sort of an addict for history counterfactuals. Right. So the the idea that George Washington could have ended up a British Army officer is one of them. Uh, I mean, I, I could sort of rattle off a whole bunch of them. Um, some of you may know that Fidel Castro was once a very good baseball player, and he was scouted by uh, uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates as a possible um, professional uh, baseball player, but apparently they didn't go anywhere. So he had to make other plans in Cuba. So anyway, very interesting. Um, before I hand over to Steve, uh, who will come come back about the the, the nature of U.S. Uh, membership of the Anglosphere, um, the, the the other point that that that, that, that occurred to me is I uh, mean the, the the key the phrase in your talk five eyes, which um, I think we should maybe elaborate a bit because. It started off, as you said, in 1946, um, at the end of the, the, the war in the Pacific, really. And one of the, when I was doing research in, in Australia, it was quite interesting that um, the, the reason that, that Five Eyes got going in the Pacific theater was the amount of information that was being leaked out of Australia uh, into Japanese and Russian, uh, in, sorry, into Russian hands to know what the Allied command, the Pacific command under MacArthur, which operated out of Brisbane in, in Australia. Um, basically, Australia had been hugely penetrated by Soviet uh, agents from the early 40s. Um, when the Five Eyes community was being kicked off as a you know, sort of telegraphic interconnection between Canada, US, UK, Australia, New Zealand, um, the, the, the Americans were so worried about the, um, the, the potential for Australia to be um, used by the Soviets that Britain had to send uh, MI5 and MI6 uh, leaders, uh, directors over to Australia to say to the Australians, you've got to get your act together. And even into the uh, 50s, there was 
deep worries that transcripts that were sent within the Five Eyes were going to Soviet sources. There was a book on the Venona transcripts that came out in the, uh, well, that came out recently, uh, uh, Duncan Bell, who's an Australian uh, espionage um, you know, uh, writer, uh, published the, the Venona transcripts book. But even down to um, uh, 72, there was big fears in America that Australia could be turned, you know, that, um, and, and when you're looking at the Five Eyes, Australia is pretty central because it's the Pine Gaps um, surveillance center in, in, in Northern Australia that gives the electronic coverage of the globe. I mean, as long as you've got America and you've got the UK GCHQ, um, you, you can, you know, Canada's important, New Zealand less so, so that, you know, even if it's, even if the five eyes is, as someone commented, reduced to three eyes and a blink, <laughs> as, long as, as long as those three eyes are, include Australia, you've got global coverage. But one of the problems that, you know, was identified in, in say, 72, was um, the, the Whitlam government that came in immediately recognized Soviet permanent control of the Baltic, Baltic states um, as part of its liberal progress, well, labor socialist progressive principles. But Whitlam was also thinking of removing uh, the Australia from Five Eyes. So one of the worries in our currently um, divided polities, we know that across the Anglosphere, conservatives see the utility of Five Eyes and, and, and see the utility of the Anglospheric relationship. But we can safely say, as you said, you know, like Trudeau's not too bothered about it. One suspects uh, an incoming Labour government in the UK wouldn't be, you know, over keen on it. And already the Australian, you know, under Albanese are less than, you know, uh, four square behind an Anglospheric understanding. And New Zealand, well, we're not even sure what planet that's on at the moment. I wondered if you'd uh, respond to all that. Uh, thank you again, David. So uh, when we talk about Kanzuk and the, uh, the myriad ties that are actually increasing uh, between the four countries, um, we can't expect that this is going to become a new uh, Anglosphere version of the European Union. Nobody would actually want that. So there's not going to be a kind of Treaty of Rome moment, I think, when the prime ministers of, the, of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and um, the UK sit down together and sign a big treaty. Um, but what we are seeing is uh, Britain post-Brexit looking very sensibly for uh, basically to rekindle its ties with its old friends. Um, to use a kind of rock and roll analogy, uh, to some degree the band is getting back together again, uh, if you allow me to do that. And uh, Brit uh, Britain and the other three countries are uh, reinforcing their, uh, their, uh, their, their trade arrangements. Uh, they're creating uh, freedom of movement, particularly for younger people, younger professionals, make it easy to move back and forth between the, the, uh, the four countries. Um, we're seeing greater levels of cooperation that already exist in the defense sphere. At, um, we're seeing uh, greater levels of uh, mutual recognition of um, professional qualifications for doctors, lawyers, accountants, and so on. So, um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, for example, Canada or Australia already have a very successful um, uh, consular sharing agreement, so Canadians who need consular assistance in the South Pacific go to Australian consulates, and Australians who, who need us, uh, consular assistance in the Caribbean and parts of Latin America go to, to a Canadian uh, mission, and both countries could also use British missions. And, and actually, Canada and the UK co-locate uh, a small number of embassies around the world. So. Again, um, despite the fact that the countries politically don't seem to be rowing in the same direction at the moment, again, as you said, with uh, left-of-center governments in Canada and Australia, 
um, a kind of beaten up Tory government in the UK and uh, New Zealand, which is likely to shift to the right and elect a conservative government uh, imminently, um, you would think that they, at the moment, politically don't have a lot in common. But again, uh, this is family. Uh, these are old friends. And yeah, maybe the band is, is getting back together at least to strum a few, fruit, few new tunes together. Steve, I'm sure you've got something to say there. Oh, lots, usually. <laughs> uh, for those of you I haven't met before, I'm Stephen Hayward, oh, yeah, should, um, a fellow of the so. Danube Institute currently, uh, and ordinarily, as I put it, an inmate at UC Berkeley out in California. Um, <laughs> you called, uh, Steve, this a personal view, and normally I do impersonal responses, but <laughs> I have to say just one thing. Uh, you remarked that you thought the American Revolution or rebellion was unnecessary. We could throw down on that for a long time, but that's for another evening. But I can't resist one of my favorite bits of trivia, which was on July 4, 1776, King George III wrote in his diary, nothing of importance happened this day. You, you referenced the <laughs> ability of communication, right? Um, he was right. <laughs> well, no, you're wrong too. Uh, uh, um, by the way, I, I, I'm gonna, since I mentioned George III, I'll drop this in now. I thought maybe I'd mention it later, but some of you may be familiar with the movie that was out, oh gosh, 30 years ago, made in Britain, The Madness of King George III, with the great Nigel Hawthorne playing King George. Uh, when the movie was released in the United States, the releasing studio marketed it as The Madness of King George. Anyone know why they did that? Because they thought, I think correctly, that if they put up, put out a movie that was The Madness of King George III, American moviegoers would think, but I didn't see the first two and I don't want to see the sequel. <laughs> I'm not kidding, they really thought that, right? And that, that bespeaks a certain American ignorance that I want to make a point of in a moment. Um, and also counterfactuals, you know Churchill's essay, what if Lee had not won the Battle of Gettysburg? That's a great fun one. Um, so I was, I, I guess uh, I wasn't certain whether your five eyes are going to include the United States or not. Uh, and I'll sort of amplify a point you made, because I'm in agreement about it. Uh, Americans especially, but I think maybe a lot of Brits, you'll have to tell me, David, they think that the special relationship, that phrase that, what, did, it, did Churchill originate that, I suppose? They think this goes back forever because we, as... Macmillan. What's that? It was... Macmillan, okay. Uh, the Suez. But the, the point is, is that you, you talk about the Five Eyes Agreement in 1946. I think really you can date it to then, or maybe if you want to stretch it back to the Atlantic Charter with Churchill and Roosevelt. Uh, but that's not that long ago. Uh, most Americans don't know. I don't know how many Brits remember that as late as the 1890s, a prospect of open war between the United States and Britain was still alive over some disputes over... I think is Venezuela or uh, it was somewhere in Latin America, right? And and we of course there was the unpleasantness of the War of 1812, and and then the possibility that the British might take sides with the Confederate States of America in our Civil War that was a live prospect. So this uh, 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 this view we have of the uh, special relationship and the tightness of America and Britain is a very modern thing. And of course, it hasn't always been smooth. And uh, you know, the events of the last 48 hours, it's early yet, but my great worry right now is that some weeks from now, with our, the disposition of our current administration, we might see Suez II, right? Uh, I'll just you know, leave that as a marker right now. Uh, that's something that's worrying me quite a bit. Um, oh, sorry, I got the wrong page here. Scribbled my notes like crazy. And, What's that? The oh right, uh, right. Well, yeah. Uh, well, I don't. Yeah. These are up beyond over my pay grade. Uh, but I mentioned about you know the madness of King George in America because people wouldn't realize that it was okay. Uh, there is this great problem that's bothered me forever of of. Um, American ignorance, and you were very generous, I think, and, you know, Woodrow Wilson had left town, he'd had a stroke by 1920, he kind of checked out, and therefore, he didn't really weigh in on what ended up being a Trianon Treaty that dismembered Hungary. I am guessing that not more than one in a thousand Americans even know about that treaty. I mean, American ignorance of 
well, our own history, we're pretty bad at these days, but European history kind of ends with, you know, Britain and France and maybe a little bit of Germany, and there was that funny fellow with the mustache way back when, and that's it. I, 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 I hate to sort of diss my own fellow citizens, but a lot of Americans would have some difficulty placing Hungary on a map or other countries. I'll admit that I don't do very well at finding on a blank map, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, you know, Laurel and Hardystan, and all the rest of them, right? Um, but th this is a huge problem because, I'll put it this way, when you have the United States in a five uh, partnership alliance with the same language, and same cultural and general institutions, understanding of the rule of law, it's a little bit, to put it in commercial terms, and so you have a foot in the commercial world, it's a little bit like the the a soft drink bottlers association where Coke and Pepsi dominate it. And if you're a small cola producer, you have to do what they say. Now, if I thought that our foreign policy establishment in whatever party is running the government had their act together, I would feel better about things. But in fact, and you, you, you kind of hint at this, but I'll go further than you do and say that uh, ever since the Wilsonian uh, um, change in America's disposition, We've approached the world more like social engineers, heedless of the particular cultures and histories of particular nations. Uh, and, and you know, never mind, you know, rainbow flags and all the, the current issues of the moment. It's actually much worse than that, really. That is, I think, in some ways a transient thing that's okay on the mind of the current American ambassador and, and all the rest of that. Uh, and that's the biggest failing, I think. And, and I, I go in some detail about the way our foreign policy apparatus operates and What's that famous old line of Dull uh, Churchill about Dulles? He, he's a bull who brings his own china shop with him, something like that. Well, we're still operating that way, and I think it's unfortunate. Um, finally, uh, I have a lot of notes, but I'll just end with this, and then we can follow up. Uh, Stephen, you only said one word wrong in your talk. You said Alger Hiss was almost certainly a Soviet agent. There's no almost about it. <laughs> this is a slam dunk. It's done and over. He was a Soviet agent. You're probably being nice, which is fine of you, but um, that, that's one that I'm still uh, alive about. By the way, I do ask young Americans, especially young American conservatives who fashion themselves as up on politics and history and all the rest, I ask them, was Alger Hiss guilty? And I'm surprised at some of very bright people who don't know who he was. And I always say that's another sign of certain kind of unseriousness. One thing I've always appreciated about my Hungarian friends, and I've had a number in graduate school and so forth, I've talked about it various times, is they do understand the importance of history, and we're just terrible at that. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Uh, Steve, uh, thank you for that. Uh, you, you, that. That is so rich that I, I, I uh, will have to pick off a few things, some, some meat off the bone here. So firstly, when I said that... Um, uh, that the break between Britain and the, and the American colonies uh, was, in a sense, not predestined. In a, I, I, mean, I merely mean that it, um, it's not that it, it shouldn't have happened or couldn't have happened, but under somewhat different circumstances, maybe it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. And I'm not saying, actually, that the fact that it happened was a bad thing, because, of course, it allowed for the birth of... Uh, sort of the most dynamic, energetic country in the history of the world to, to come about. Uh, per, perhaps if it had stayed British, it, we would have had just one large Canada with all that entails, a very decaffeinated, polite uh, country that it isn't quite a lot as alive and kicking as the United States uh, has always been. Uh, so I'm just suggesting that, yeah, may, may, it's always possible to say that things were not necessarily predestined. Uh, that, that's really what I was getting at. Can, can I just, sorry, can I make a comment on just that point, because it's a really fun one, but a serious one, uh, which is, first of all, I'd say, oh, God, help us if we were like Canada. Uh, you know, the old joke Americans like to tell is, uh, if Captain Bly had been Canadian, the book would have been strong disagreement on the bounty, because you know how polite and nice Canadians are. But of course, you know, Canada owes some of its origin to Tory loyalists who moved there. And so 200 years later, the whole world's going to go with the metric system. Canada adopts it in about a week. I mean, that's an exaggeration. We tried it in the United States. We put up some metric signs on our interstate highways, and everybody said, no, we're sticking with feet and inches and yards. We don't want any of this European metric stuff. Next thing you know, you'll have us playing soccer. 
right? And so that, I mean, I don't know. I can't really explain that rationally, but that's sort of very American. Yeah. On that, on that particular uh, Kanzuk note, the, the funny thing is uh, the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand have only ever partially gone metric. And they've gone metric, gone metric in different ways. So you buy uh, petrol in liters in the UK, but uh, you measure distance in miles. So you can get miles per liter. <laughs> and in Canada, everything to do with housing is still in s square feet and so on and so forth. But your temperature is in um, Celsius and so on. So in, in, in you know, we, we speak of the Anglosphere as a very pragmatic, common sense, uh, kind of um, part of the world. It's not based on French Cartesian <laughs> rational principles. It, we, we, it's common law principles, uh, which means that it sometimes gets a bit messy. Um, as for messy things, uh, you know, the uh, again, when we talk about the English-speaking world being the dominant economic, military, technological, scientific, academic, everything force in the world, especially concentrated in the US, but to some degree in the rest of the Anglosphere. What happens in the Anglosphere matters, what people in the Anglosphere think matters, how they vote matters, um, what foreign policy, particularly the United States take matters. And as you say, um, American uh, foreign policy and America's posture and the things it does in the world can shift uh, every four years, rather rad radically, dramatically, and uh, uh, perhaps America shows less um, uh, sort of continuity from administration to administration in terms of what Americans, America's principles and interests are. And I think that this is this is an area of concern. Yeah, I, I, I think that's um, a very good point, really. And I think your, you know your point about the American. Um, tendency to not even know where the rest of the world is and, you know, not know much about history, perhaps. I mean, there's a general problem, you know, the lack of his historical awareness. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the current madness about statues in the UK. But um, coming back to your point about the, the special relationship, which I think um, is worth interrogating a bit because... Um, the term came about, as far as I, I, I can read it, after Suez. In other words, um, the decision made at Suez when Eden and um, uh, the French government decided they would back you know, Israel over the Suez Canal. And then it was um, the American government, it was Eisenhower, you know, cons Republican American government, that told the Brits and the French and the Israelis to get out, you know? And, and this was part, I would say, and maybe this comes back to Yalta as well. Um, Roosevelt um, hated the idea of empire, you know? And, and, and one of the, 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 part of the thinking at the end of the Second World War was not only that, you know, um, fascism would be defeated, but imperialism would never come back. That, that was both British, the British Empire and the French and the Dutch. Um, they changed their minds slightly after 49 when um, you know, the Iron Curtain went down and it might have been a good, good idea if the French were still in Vietnam and the Brits were still in Southeast Asia. But 56 was, was a very, you know, because certain things happened after 56. A, Macmillan tried to say, the, 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 the successor to, um, to Eden, to say, despite this humiliation, we've still got a special relationship. Um, you know, we are Greece to America's Rome now. And you think, what a piece of self-delusion that was. Because de Gaulle rather made the sensible decision. You, we can't trust the Americans. We've got to, we've got to have a Gaullist structure in place. And there is always the worry, I think, with the Kanzuk relationship, that America is, is you know, the biggest beast in, in any Anglospheric arrangement, and it can change on a dime. You know. So I wondered what you and Steve thought about that. Well, again, um, the United States, you know, I'll again use the uh, expression senior partner. Yeah. I, I think the other English-speaking countries understand that um, 
Washington is the driving force and that it calls the shots in many respects. So in London, Ottawa, Canberra and Wellington, they, they get that e even if at times um, they don't like it. Mm. But uh, that, that is just uh, the nature of things. By the way, just to come back to Alger Hiss, the reason I used almost certainly, <laughs> and I, I very specifically used the word Soviet asset and sympathizer is the, you know, uh, it's a question also of chronology because when he was at Yalta, what was his relationship with the Soviets at that stage? Right. Uh, well, I'll just say that one, uh, actually it's Stan, one cold warrior I know said Alger Hiss was the only person at Yalta who knew what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's, yeah, there's, uh, I think he was still thought of as an asset in the Venona papers where he was, had a code name and whatnot, yeah. but I don't remember specifically. Um, it, the, the, question you raise on, um, well, I'll go back to the point you made in your formal talk. Uh, you, you drew our attention to the US, uh, uh, UK, Australian concord that we have now, and- AUKUS. AUKUS, is that what we're calling it, AUKUS? A little awkward, okay. Uh, and of course, uh, one part you left out that of course was all over the news was that represented a huge, I guess I'll say humiliation to France, who was going to be the submarine supplier for yeah. Australia. And normally you would think, well, maybe I'm overstating this, you would think that Australia and New Zealand, they might want to do business with the French just to stake out a little bit of independence from us. On the other hand, you also made the point, I'll get this to reinforce what you're saying, is uh, the United States and the other English-speaking countries really are the technological leaders in the world. So if you want the best submarines, I think you're going to want to do it with us. The French submarines are probably very good, but with the growing worry about China and their advanced weaponry, we're going to want to have a united um, you know, technological front to try and stay ahead of that, which the French probably won't do, I think. That may be chauvinistic on my part. Uh, and so that's, that's a very practical thing. That doesn't, none of that really relies on sentimentality or a special relationship. That's hard-nosed calculation uh, of what's going to be in the national interest of that, those countries in that region. It's a, it's a really good point. In fact, I probably should have mentioned the humiliation of France in that episode. They were really caught by surprise in, the, in that episode. So France was going to supply Australia with some excellent um, conventional submarines. Mm -hmm. The Australians decided to go nuclear and, uh, and to do it with the British Royal Navy and the US Navy and uh, uh, all the technology that's available there. But um, we have, uh, I, know, I can see at least two uh, gentlemen who are ambassadors in the room. There's also, uh, an, there's also a term called diplomacy. And practicing di diplomacy also means being diplomatic and handling things with a certain finesse. And uh, unfortunately, in this case, the Australians completely blindsided France. Um, and... and uh, the Australians have felt that they, they could have handled it much better. They have since tried to uh, repair relations with France, and I think that's more or less worked. But um, the fact that Australia, um, at least initially, didn't even feel the need to do that at the, at the very beginning and just uh, do it as a fait accompli and hold a press conference and announce to the world that there's a new trilateral security pact and we're calling it AUKUS and so on, um, uh, certainly it... It caught the, caught the French by surprise, and I, I think it could have been um, better handled. Now, can I France is not an insignificant, we, we haven't touched on France, but France is still a, a major player in the world. Can I ask Stephen one more question about his talk? Because uh, I didn't have anything to say about it, but you, you talked a lot about uh, the importance of, uh, well, uh, you know, Anglo-American forces in Eastern Europe as part of NATO. One of the things we know right now is that Poland is maybe going to be the country that spends the most of its GDP on defense. And we know the reasons for that. They really hate the Russians for a long, long time. Uh, what do you think of this idea of moving a lot of American troops from Germany to Poland, since the Germans are still lagging in their defense expenditures and lagging in other ways? Do you like that idea? Uh, I would say generally, yes. But again, I think it's worth coming back to, the. Uh, as you know, Poland and Hungary have a, sort of a thousand-year friendship. And it's been slightly strained because of the different views, on, diver, somewhat diverging views on the Ukraine war. But um, Hungary is, of course, in the, in the Carpathian Basin. 
And it has a completely different historical experience despite having many cultural similarities to Polish culture. But Poland has lived uh, for a thousand years on the North European plain. It's basically flat all, I mean, again, you know this, but all the way from nor Northern Germany, all the way to the Ural Mountains. And Poland has lived between the German lands and Muscovy and Russia during this, this time and, and um, has a lot of scar tissue related to, to that geographic position. Uh, so Poland um, doesn't, is happy to have more U.S. troops. It already has a lot on, on, on Polish soil. It would be, again, happy to see more, but it's also bulking up its, uh, its defense forces. So it's going to get the, uh, you know, the top of the line uh, BMW fighter jets. They have 35 Joint Strike Fighter. It's buying a lot of those at a good price from the, from the U.S. It's going to have uh, Abrams tanks, and in the meantime, it's importing a lot of terrific Korean uh, armaments, tanks, planes, et cetera. The Koreans are very good at what they're doing and they offer a kind of stopgap. So the largest, most powerful land army in Europe, possibly in five to 10 years, will be the Polish, uh, in part because the Poles uh, don't want to rely on other countries. Uh, our national historical experience has shown us uh, that relying on other countries, as we did in 1939, particularly we relied on France, mm. uh, which made a commitment, supposedly ironclad, to come to Poland's defense if it had been attacked. In fact, the French did absolutely nothing and just sat behind the Maginot Line, as you will recall. Uh, so Poland um, wants to ensure it has quite a lot of hard power as a deterrent. Uh, and if it also has strong relationships within NATO and uh, with the United States separately, even apart from NATO, that's all great. Um, and uh, I think uh, Poles feel that they, they don't want to see these tanks and planes ever have to be used in, in war. Uh, in a certain sense, with any deterrent, uh, that if you if you have to sort of um, load them up with ammunition and send them, you know, into the conflict zone, they've already failed in their mission of deterrent. So I think uh, those who think that um, that Poland wants to go to war with Russia, or you know, their Polish fighter pilots are just waiting to sh shoot down those first Russian jets, I, I really don't think that's the case. I think. It really is a matter of um, looking at the current but also historical uh, environment in Europe and wanting to deter. Okay, well, um, that anything else you wanted to add to? So maybe we can ask the audience if they've got some questions for... Yeah, okay. And, and if people wanted to raise the... Israel question as well. Feel free to do so. Hi. Um, again, my name is Logan West. I'm a research fellow with the Danube Institute. And I'd like to piggyback off of what the professor was talking about with regards to Poland and its relationship with, with the Five Eyes. Specifically when it comes to security, um, the Five Eyes relationship is ultimately an intelligence relationship. As Poland is expanding its portfolio as the center of defense for Central Europe and Eastern Europe, what does the intelligence relationship look like, do you think, for the future between the Five Eyes and Poland? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, po well, Poland is not going to get an invitation to join the Five Eyes. There may be other eyes we might see join, like Japan. I mean, uh, there are a lot of things that are talked about. but. Um, I, I must say I, I, uh, I, I can't quite recall all of the different intelligence sharing relationships even in Europe because as you may know there, there are all sorts of other um, uh, uh, allied uh, intelligence sharing relationships aside from Five Eyes even if it's the most important one. So. Um, yeah, essentially, uh, Poland has become uh, a more significant uh, player. I mean, it is a country of 40 million. It's been booming economically for a long period. Uh, it is uh, now has a lot of high, hard power. It's in a strategically important part of the world. Um, certainly, it's, it's a more central country in terms of everything, including defense and intelligence sharing. But um, I... I, I uh, I would hesitate to say that the Five Eyes would be growing in that direction. 
uh, may, maybe elsewhere. And there, there are a, a, lot, a number of other very interesting intelligence sharing re relationships around the world that also involve um, key allies. Well, I would say that today, the, uh, the, I mean, there's a very strong U.S.-Polish relationship and a very strong U.K.-Polish relationship. And I, I would see those uh, continuing in a, in, a, in a quite substantial way. Thank you. Okay, any, some other questions from the audience? I want to go back to the subject of the submarines, because that interested me. Um, would you guys think that uh, the switch from the French to the uh, British and the Americans was connected in any way to the Chinese offensive on the Solomon Islands? Uh, well, it, the, the, so the question is about the, the way in which the French were dumped over AUKUS. Um, in relation to this, what the Chinese penetration of the Pacific, basically. Yeah. Okay. I think of the Solomon Islands in particular. Mm -hmm. I, I, I must say I don't have any special insight on that. I, I do think that um, Australia has felt the need. I mean, again, I would contrast here Canada, which is actually now cutting the defense budget as part of a general uh, def budget cut situation. In, in Canada, so Canada's pushing back the dates of delivery of F-35s, new frigates. Actually, Canada, and, so this is another Kanzuk issue. So for the first time really since the 50s, uh, the UK Royal Navy, Royal Canadian Navy, Royal Australian Navy share a new warship design. Uh, so this is the global surface combatant. Uh, they're already cutting steel for it, in, in the UK and Australia, Canada is still talking about it. Uh, so that is uh, it's kind of an interesting vignette. So Canada, sadly, has been a bit of a free rider on, on defense, but Australia has been investing, obviously, a lot more. Uh, they see the threat. They see the, their position. They see the need to take a, a leadership role uh, in the Asia-Pacific region. And I think, um, to put it simply on the, the move from conventional to nuclear submarines, their thinking is simply, we need, we need the best, most advanced everything the, in terms of kit. But I think, I'll add that, I think there's also a political statement involved in that, beyond just the technology, which I emphasized as you did. If you go back, gosh, 55 years ago now, both Australia and New Zealand, I think, sent troops to Vietnam to fight alongside our troops in that great misadventure. Well, why did they do that? I, I don't think it was because, in fact, I'm pretty certain it was not because of some sentimental special relationship. We're all in the Anglosphere in this together. Uh, I, I think I, some years ago now, I saw some documents and some good analyses that said Australia and New Zealand, I guess you'd say, I think it was overstated, were persuaded by the domino theory and worried that if Vietnam fell to the communists, and then Thailand, and you had all the, and China, who, who knows what their ambitions were, uh, that they'd be next. And so they thought it was important to, and so I think now the similar thing's happening with China. I mean, when you have the Japanese and the South Koreans appearing together publicly and kissing rings, I mean, they're not enemies, but they have historic dislike for each other. That tells you that uh, they're really worried about, uh, and the Philippines and all the rest. So I think there's a, uh, China is galvanizing an awful lot of countries in the region to say, we need to extend our cooperation, we need to take serious military steps and have a united front, otherwise we're gonna get picked off one by one by China, something like that. Right, and then also, um, I, you make a very good point, Steve. So uh, really, uh, Australia has felt very exposed since the Second World War. And when it felt um, that Hong Kong and Singapore fell to the Japanese, that they no longer could rely upon Britain for, for their own defense. They had to rely, rely upon the United States. So this is partly a kind of coming back to old friends and old partners story as well. Uh, Steve makes an interesting point about Vietnam. Many people are unaware that um, Australia, New Zealand uh, fielded some very competent forces 
in Vietnam with some amazing um, jungle warfare capabilities that they'd honed in the 1950s in Malaya. And uh, for, for those of you who like war movies, I, I highly recommend an Australian-made movie that's won some awards called Danger Close. Uh, it's a movie uh, set in 1966 that is about uh, the most important battle that the uh, Aussies and Kiwis took place in, the Battle of Long Tan, they actually took pretty uh, heavy casualties. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, Canada may feel safe, but, uh, even New Zealand to a certain degree, but Australia feels exposed, and they're, well, they're know, not lawyering up, they're, they're uh, manning up. With well, you know, a footnote to that that you both may know, and I only know because my dad was a Navy pilot based in Australia from World War II, is that the initial British strategy that came from the Churchill administration was the Brisbane line. You know, the Japanese are going to overrun Australia. We'll try and hold them at a line across. You'll try to hold them halfway down. And it was our General MacArthur who said nuts to that. We're going to go down there and try and stop that. And uh, well, but, that, So the Australians said, well, you know, we're, we're not at the top of the list to be defended here, No, no, I, I mean, the, you're, you're quite right. I don't think that's very interesting because... Um, uh, Australia had always thought of itself in terms of its security, as, as they often say, in terms of great and powerful friends. And, um, you know, the, the relationship with the UK was um, rendered a bit sort of compromised by the way, uh, well, uh, basically the Brits had abandoned Australia after 41 for various reasons, but they were not prepared to send Australian troops back when they were in Europe, you know, so considerable Australian forces in Crete, for instance, which Churchill, you know, said, you, you, you can't go back. Um, Menzies, however, who became the greatest uh, Australian prime minister, was actually working in terms of a, an, an imperial um, or a Commonwealth, uh, com you know, committee in London to run the war. You know, it, at one point, you know, when... when uh, Parliament thought Churchill was getting past his sell-by date, Menzies would take over. You know, he was seen as a potential successor. But the, the Australian position in, 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 in the Asia-Pacific, I think, you, you know, Steve's absolutely right. It feels more exposed now than it has done for a while. And it looks, it's always looked to America as its great and powerful friend after, um, after 41 and 42. Um, and I think the, the role of MacArthur was very interesting because he, he set up his command in Brisbane, whereas the Brits wanted to put it in Melbourne, you know, and he said, well, go as far north as I can and we'll run it out of there. But the other feature is now New Zealand, you know, so central to Australian security is the South Pacific. You know, um, there's a Pacific forum that Australia has been very involved with for, since the 50s and 60s. And, and increasingly, the South Pacific islands are being you know, consistently taken out by Chinese money, Chinese resources, Belt and Road initiatives. Even New Zealand is you know, deeply penetrated by Chinese uh, influence and... Um, uh, economic heft, you know, so, so one of the uh, concerns now in terms of the five eyes, I mean, you know, Steve's right, it'll probably go conservative, which is a relief, but for a long time now, New Zealand has been increasingly indifferent to the five eyes and increasingly indifferent to the idea of uh, an Anglosphere, really. I mean, the Jacinda Ahern is, is like, it was you know, New Zealand's versions of Trudeau, but perhaps even worse, you know. So um, I, I suppose to both of you, the question is, well, yeah, Australia's, you know, in there. Um, and the relationship between it, the UK, and the US is very important. But actually the power that's going to be perhaps more important in this relationship, which we haven't discussed, is not New Zealand, but another Commonwealth country, India. I wondered what you... And, uh, you know, we would like to obviously see India um, more in our corner than, for example, with the, the BRICS countries. Yes, that's right. Uh, so I think India has a complicated situation. It has traditionally relied on Soviet Union, later Russia, for, for weapons. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a complicated story. 
Um, I, I don't have a, I'll just say I am hopeful about India and I'll just stop there. Okay. <laughs> All right, some more questions? Uh, this one. How do you evaluate uh, the Chinese attempts to gain ground in the Central and Eastern European region because there are many ongoing infrastructure uh, projects, not just in Hungary, but uh, in the Balkans region, or, or there is the 16 plus one platform. Uh, for me, to me, it's not clear the reason because it's, I think it's an insignificant area for the Chinese. Thank you. You know, the curious thing is uh, China um, seems to regard all parts of the world as in some way strategic for it. So um, you may be surprised to know that, the, I believe it is the case still, that the largest embassy in Nassau in the Bahamas is the Chinese embassy. So you'd wonder what, what possible reason could China have to have an enormous embassy in, in, in the Bahamas um, Okay, they are building hotels there, uh, ch Chinese-owned ho hotels and casinos. Uh, they are also um, cultivating um, governments in, in the Caribbean, very close to the U.S. Uh, it's an issue everywhere. China, I mean, it could be that China's um, wherewithal in terms of financial resources, given the way things are heading, they may be more constrained in future years than they've been constrained in, in recent years, where they've been all over the world doing all kinds of things, some sort of uh, above the line, more visible, some things less visible, uh, but they've been very active. So uh, I live in British Columbia, and when I'm in the city of Vancouver, uh, Vancouver is, which used to be known in a nice way as Hongcouver, because you had all these amazing Hong Kong people uh, come to Vancouver in the um, in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, and they're 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 terrific people, and they brought a lot to uh, to Canada. But nowadays, it's very easy, at least when I am in the city of Vancouver, to to find that I'm I'm stuck stuck in a traffic jam, and all the cars around me are being driven by young Chinese. And all the cars end with the letter I, as in Ferrari, Bugatti, Maserati. So yeah, there is a lot of Chinese influence, money, investments. Uh, I know of people whose careers have stalled out and they've essentially become legal Chinese agents of influence. They've essentially joined the Chinese payroll. I mean, they're not doing anything illegal, uh, as, as far as we know, but um, in some cases, uh, but uh, it, it's a good point. They're, they're around. So I'm not a great expert on China. I, I try to follow what I think are anomalies of what we read in the newspaper. Uh, you know, their official statistics and claims of this and that. Their COVID numbers were clearly phony, for example. And it does look like uh, that they can't conceal the evidence of serious economic difficulties right now, overbuilding real estate, banking problems that may be lead to a crash. Uh, so. I'm now old enough where I can make a lot of statements that begin with, I'm so old I can remember, in this case, the late 80s, when very smart people said, Japan is eating our lunch in America. By the year 2010, they'll be the largest economy in the world and will pass the United States. There's so much better where we are technology. And of course, we know how that story ended. Within two, three years, their real estate uh, market, which had gotten into a bubble territory, crashed. Their banking system crashed. Their stock market crashed and was... I'd say they never entirely recovered from that, but they were a decade when they were totally dead. Some of that's demographic, and China's following the same demographic trajectory as Japan very quickly. So one of the things Japan did, and I think you may see this start to happen with China's investments in a very similar way, is China in the late 80s was buying up farmland in America. They bought Rockefeller Center. They bought the Pebble Beach Golf Course. In the case of the Pebble Beef Golf Course, they paid, just give one example, I can give a bunch, they paid $800 million for it, sold it three years later for $500 million. The same thing with Rockefeller Center. They lost their shirt on some of their foreign investments. And so some of the Belt and Road stuff, I don't know the details of it, but I could see China having similar problems with all of that. Uh, and so we'll see, but that's, that's the thing that I think is at least a 50% probability of happening. They're bigger than, what do you think, Steve? I mean, you really know it better than I do. Well, uh, I mean, I, I think uh, until very recently, it was assumed by many people 
uh, the Chinese uh, economy would overtake the U.S. economy in size. I think that's now disputed, yes, whether that will right. ever even happen. And, and India is the, the coming economy yes. rather than right. China, you know. And uh, so, yeah, I think we've got to be skeptical about how powerful, and I think it could be in a Japan stagflation phase for, you know, coming up. Um, any more questions from the audience? Well, that was uh, an intriguing uh, discussion of the hopes and fears of the Anglosphere. And um, thank you for all coming. And thank you, Stephen and Stephen, for your presentation and responses. Thank you. Thank you.